Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. When we last met, we dug into the mathematics behind wave equations, and we discovered that a moving one-dimensional wave has this equation. But that was the equation for a general kind of moving wave. Today, I want to show you how we can apply this specifically to wave functions, and we'll see right away that we can get some real practical information about actual chemical systems. To begin, remember that this equation has two variables, position and time. However, in video 5, we saw that most of the time we'll use the time-independent wave function. So that means we can treat the wave function as though it doesn't change with time, and we can ignore the part of this equation that deals with time. That leaves us with this equation. So, let's take this generic wave equation and consider how it relates to the wave function of a physical system. We'll start by looking at a simple model system. This one may not seem very realistic, but we'll see soon that it's actually more realistic than you might think. Imagine that we have an area of space where all the energy of our system is kinetic energy and none is potential energy. That means that the system can move freely in that region of space. There are no potential energy barriers that it might have to overcome, so its movement is unrestricted. However, at the boundaries of this part of space, the potential energy suddenly becomes infinite, and the kinetic energy drops to zero. I'll plot the potential energy on the y-axis, which means that there's an infinitely high barrier at each end of this area of space. Since the kinetic energy becomes zero, that means it's impossible for the system to continue in the direction of the barrier. So as soon as it reaches the barrier, it reverses direction. So the system is confined to this region of space. It can never pass the barrier because the barrier is infinitely high. For that reason, this model is often called the particle in a box. I keep referring to the system being confined in the box. But what is the system? Technically, it could be anything, an atom, a molecule, or even a large group of molecules. However, the larger the model, the more complicated the wave function will be. For that reason, let's look at what might be the simplest system we could possibly have, a single electron. So, our model consists of one electron confined to the box. And how large is the box? It can actually be any length from microscopic to cosmic in size. Let's just say it has an arbitrary length that we'll call a. So the left side of the box is at the coordinate 0, and the right side is at coordinate a. But wait, this should look very familiar to you. This is exactly the same model we had in the previous video. In that video, we imagined a wave confined to a finite region of space, and we determined that the wave equation had this form. But since we're only looking at the time-independent wave function, we can eliminate the terms containing t, which gives us this. Note that since this equation represents a wave function, we're now using the symbol psi instead of u. And now that we're looking at an actual wave function, we can notice a few interesting details about this wave that we skipped in the last video. First, in that video, I declared that the wave should be tied down at both ends of the box, so that the amplitude at the ends is zero. But I didn't give you a reason that we should make that assumption. However, because this wave is now a wave function, we can see why it's necessary to have those boundary conditions. You might recall that back in video 3, we saw that every realistic wave function must satisfy certain conditions, and one of those conditions is that it must be continuous. There can't be any sudden jumps in the amplitude of the wave. However, in the particle in a box model, we know that the wave function is exactly equal to zero everywhere outside the box. That means that at the edges of the box, the wave function must be equal to zero, so we have to tie the wave down at either end. We could certainly write an equation for a wave that doesn't reach zero at the edges of the box, but then the wave wouldn't be a valid wave function. But this raises a slight problem. 
If you look at that list of conditions, it says that the wave function must be continuous. But so must the derivative. And the derivative of this wave function is not continuous. Why not? Well, outside the box, the wave function is zero, so it's a flat horizontal line. As you might remember, the derivative of a function is equal to its slope. So outside the box, the slope is zero. However, the wave function inside the box is a sine wave, and the slope of a sine wave is one at the origin. In fact, as you know from your calculus course, the derivative of a sine wave is a cosine. So the derivative of our wave function is zero outside the box, and a cosine wave in the box. That means there's a discontinuity at either end of the box. Did you catch that problem when we wrote the equation for the wave function? If you did, give yourself a big pat on the back. That's a very subtle problem that's easy to miss, and it is a very real problem with this model. The fact that the derivative of the wave function is discontinuous tells us that it isn't a realistic wave function. But that actually shouldn't be too surprising. The model we're using is pretty unrealistic. It imagines that there's an infinitely high barrier at the edges of the box, and that's physically impossible. We'll look at much more realistic models in future videos, but those infinitely high barriers are the reason why the wave function is unrealistic. But for the purposes of this discussion, we'll let that slide. We'll see that even though this isn't a very realistic model, we can still use it to learn a lot about real systems. There's two useful things that we can do now right away. First, we can use the wave function to find the energies of some real chemical systems. And second, we can find out what the constant B is equal to. You might recall that we didn't find out what B is when we talked about wave functions in the last video. Today, we'll figure out b, which will mean that there are no unknown terms left in our wave function, so we'll know exactly what the form of the wave function is for this system. So first, let's talk about the energy of the system. You might recall from video 5 that the energy of a system is given by the Schrodinger equation, which is this. Now, in our model, the system is confined to the inside of the box, where the potential energy is equal to zero. In the Schrodinger equation, the potential energy is given by this second term. So, since the potential energy is zero, we can drop that term out. That leaves us with this. Let's rewrite this a little. First, we can move E psi to the left side of the equation. Now let's get the term with the second derivative by itself by dividing by negative h bar squared over 2m, which gives us this. So, why did we rewrite the equation this way? Well, if you compare this equation to the generic differential equation we used in the previous video, you'll see that they have the same format. Our equation has psi instead of z, the variable x instead of little z, and instead of n squared, we have 2me over h bar squared. The solution to the generic equation is this. So that means the solution to our equation is a times cosine of the square root of 2me over h bar squared times x plus b times the sine of the square root of 2me over h bar squared times x. This is very similar to the equation we had in the previous video, and we solve it in exactly the same way, by applying the boundary condition. For example, the first boundary condition states that the wave function is equal to zero when x is zero. If we apply that condition to our equation, we plug in zero for psi and zero for x. That gives us zero equals a times the cosine of zero plus b times the sine of zero. The cosine of zero is equal to one and the sine of zero is equal to zero. So this equation simplifies to just 0 equals a. So a is 0, which means that 
the first term in our wave function drops out. Now we apply the second boundary condition, which states that the wave function is equal to zero when x is a. If we apply that condition to our equation, we plug in zero for psi and a for x. That gives us zero equals b times the sine of the square root of 2me over h bar squared times a. As we saw in the previous video, the sine is only equal to zero when we're taking the sine of a multiple of pi. So that tells us that the square root of 2me over h bar squared times a is equal to pi times an integer n. So why was that worth figuring out? Simple. We can now solve this equation for the energy E, which will allow us to find the energies of some simple chemical systems. To solve this equation for E, we first square both sides in order to get rid of the square root. That gives us this. Now we solve for E, which gives us n squared pi squared h bar squared over 2ma squared. That's an equation we can use to find the energies of some systems. It might seem like this isn't a very useful equation because it only applies to a particle in a box, and we know that's not a realistic system. But it's more realistic than you might think. When we have a series of conjugated single and double bonds, the electrons become delocalized. You already know that if you've taken an organic chemistry course. For example, suppose we have this molecule, 1357 nonatetrine. Because it has alternating single and double bonds, there are delocalized electrons along the carbon backbone. Now, suppose a delocalized electron in that molecule gains energy so that it jumps from the n equals 3 energy level to the n equals 4 energy level. How much energy does that take? We can use our energy equation to find out. We'll calculate the energies for the n equals 3 and n equals 4 levels and take the difference. We know the value of n for each equation, and the rest of the numbers are constants. You might recall that h bar is Planck's constant divided by 2 pi, where Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th power joules times seconds. In the denominator, we have m, the mass of the system. Our system is an electron, and electrons have a mass of 9.1094 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Finally, A is the length of the box. The box in this case is the distance between the carbons on either end of the molecule. They're separated by eight conjugated carbon-carbon bonds. Even though it's not a perfectly straight line, that doesn't matter the electron can move freely from one end of the conjugated bond system to the other, but it can't move past the last carbon on either end, and that's enough to make this system similar to our particle in a box. Each of the conjugated bonds has a length of 145 picometers, and a picometer is 10 to the minus 12 meters. Since there are eight of them, that means the total length of the conjugated bonds is eight times 145 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. So that's our value for A. When we plug all those numbers into our equation and solve it, we get 4.030 times 10 to the minus 19 when n equals 3, and 7.164 times 10 to the minus 19 when n is equal to 4. But what about the units? If you check the units, we have joules squared times seconds squared in the numerator and kilograms times meters squared in the denominator. But think about the definition of a joule. A joule is equal to kilograms times meters squared over seconds squared. But if you look carefully, you'll see that that's what we have with these units. So our units here are joules squared divided by joules, which is just plain joules. So, to finally answer our question,
the energy needed to raise a delocalized electron in this molecule from n equals 3 to n equals 4 is the difference between our two results. And that's 3.134 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. If we convert that to wavelength, we find out that this corresponds to a photon with a wavelength of 6.343 times 10 to the minus 7 meters or 634.3 nanometers. A photon of that wavelength is yellow-orange in color. So the molecule absorbs yellow-orange photons, which makes the compound look dark blue. We can use that type of calculation to predict the absorbance exhibited by any organic molecule that has a series of conjugated bonds containing delocalized electrons. Now that we've done that, Let's look at our wave function again, and finally determine the value of the constant b. To do that, we just need to remind ourselves of the conditions that a wave function must meet. The first of those conditions is that the wave function must be normalized. We saw in video 3 that this means this integral must be equal to 1. This integral tells us the probability of finding the system between the lower and upper limits of the integral. Since the limits stretch from negative to positive infinity, it makes sense that the probability of finding the system in this range is 1. So let's actually plug our wave function into this integral. Notice that there are no imaginary numbers in the wave function, so we don't need to do anything in order to take the complex conjugate. That means we're really just multiplying the wave function by itself, which gives us b squared times the square of the sine of n pi x over a dx. Now, recall that the wave function is equal to 0 outside of the box, so we only really need to worry about the wave function between x equals 0 and x equals a. So we can change the limits of our integral to those. Now we contrive to solve the integral. First, since b is a constant, we can pull b squared out of the integral. The integral we're left with has a known solution. It turns out that the integral of sine squared of a constant k times x is equal to x over 2 minus the sine of 2kx all over 4k. In our case, the constant k corresponds to n pi over a. So that means our integral is equal to x over 2 minus the sine of 2n pi x over a all over 4n pi over a. Now let's plug in the upper and lower limits. The upper limit is a, which gives us a over 2 minus the sine of 2n pi over 4n pi over a. The lower limit is 0, which gives us 0 over 2 plus the sine of 0 over 4n pi over a. But think about each of those terms. n is an integer, so the sine of 2n pi is always equal to 0. The third term is also 0, and so is the fourth. So overall, the integral is just equal to a over 2. That means our equation is now just 1 equals b squared times a over 2. If we solve for b, we find out that b is just equal to the square root of 2 over a. We can plug that in for b in our wave function, which gives us this. So now we finally have the complete wave function. This is the first actual usable wave function we've had for a chemical system. An important thing to remember is that this wave function only applies to this specific system, a single electron in a box bordered by an infinitely deep potential barrier. That's a pretty specific type of system, but now that we've seen how to determine a wave function, we'll be able to find wave functions for more realistic systems soon. Well, that's enough new material for today. We'll look at more systems and more wave functions in the next video and our examples will become more and more realistic as we go on. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week.